أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. viewers assalamu alaikum this is the muslim greeting and it means peace be with you my name is bashir mundi and i'm going to be your host on this show which is the last in our series on uh, our series named let's understand islam today we're going to be discussing hajj the muslim pilgrimage and i'm very happy to welcome my two very distinguished guests sister karen danielson who is the vice chair uh, for public educa uh, for education and outreach for the Muslim American Society Chicago chapter, Sister Karen, salam alaikum. Wa alaikum to the show. Thank you. And I also have with me Brother Faisal Hamouda, who is uh, an Imam in the Chicago area who lectures in several mosques, an engineer by training, and the president of Creative Engineering Company. You're welcome, Brother Faisal. Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Uh, the Muslim pilgrimage or Hajj uh, is an annual journey that uh, many Muslims all over the world make. Uh, we know that there are several types of uh, pilgrimage in different traditions and different religions. Uh, Sister Karen, if I would start with you, uh, how is the what? What do you understand by pilgrimage, and how is the Muslim Hajj to Mecca uh, similar to or different from other forms of pilgrimage that people make? Well, I believe that pilgrimage has perhaps a slightly different meaning for many people, uh, for everyone. But generally speaking, it's going to be some sort of personal uh, reason for wanting to seek spirituality, to, to remove themselves from their day-to-day -day, uh, activity, maybe even their own homeland or, or where they feel secure, and seek out some uh, geographical location where they feel will um, help inspire them to be more of a spiritual being, something that will maybe re have a renewal of faith for them, um, sort of a sabbatical, a time off, a time away from the, the everyday type of life. And it generally is a journey to some location other than what they are most familiar with. And that location may have a spiritual, religious significance attached to, uh, you know, to the person. And uh, people of many faiths, and uh, all faiths practically have some sort of pilgrimage that is performed by the, the pr practitioners of that faith. Um, in Islam, we have the pilgrimage to the Kaaba, or to the city of Mecca. And um, this pilgrimage is a, a required journey on every Muslim in their lifetime to visit this place, this house of God, and to, uh, there are many reasons and purposes behind it, but the Quran says uh, the first 
house set up for mankind was surely the one at Becca or in the location of Mecca now. It was rich in blessings or it is rich in blessings and a source of guidance for all those in the world. In it there are signs manifest, for example, the station of Abraham. Whoever enters it attains security. Pilgrimage, therefore, is a duty men owe to God and for those who can afford the journey. So this is a, a required um, act in, in our faith of Islam. Um, and then there are, you know, many details uh, surrounding the requirements of performing this journey. Interesting. Uh, it is, 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 it's interesting to uh, hear the verses of the Quran that you've quoted, uh, God commanding to pilgrimage, and related to that, Sister Karen said, uh, Brother Faisal, she said that uh, it's, it's a required journey. Uh, now, how does the pilgrimage itself where does it belong in the total picture of Islam in the rituals? Is it, I mean, is it like people who feel, you know, to take a tourist vacation, to go to Mecca and see the locations, or, you know, people make journeys for different purposes. For the Muslim, what is, what is the place of the Hajj itself, the, the pilgrimage, in the total framework of his obligations or her obligations as a, as a Muslim? When you ask any Muslim about the pillars of Islam, which is really the basics, rituals of Islam, they will tell you the first thing is to declare that there's only one God, and Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the last of the prophets and messengers. And then to perform prayers. And a Muslim is required to pray five times a day. They can pray more. And then to pay zakah, which is for those who have money, in excess of their need. And then to fast the month of Ramadan, which is one month throughout the year. And then it comes the fifth pillar, which is making the Hajj, the pilgrimage journey to Mecca, and to do all the rituals have been prescribed by the Quran and by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, once in a lifetime. Because it's a journey really present to oneself our commitment to this religion by doing the prayers. Anybody can do prayers in their homes and anybody can do fasting because there's a lot of people who can even do it for just weight loss. And people can pay zakat, there's a lot which is charity, people can pay charity. But to take away time from your daily and from your life and then to go a certain place and to be there with so many people at the same time, and to go th through certain rituals, that's an additional commitment, an extra commitment that shows your commitment to this religion. And also, it's not an easy task to do. And that's why God only required it to be only once in a lifetime. However, there's people who have done it more than once. I personally have done it twice. Interesting. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Faisal. Uh, so, we're saying now that the pilgrimage is a required act, it's an obligation on a Muslim. And uh, you mentioned, Brother Faisal, that um, once in a lifetime to whoever can afford it. Now, uh, Sister Karen, uh, when you say whoever can afford it, I mean, is there a certain qualification or a requirement for who, go, who can go to Hajj and who goes to Hajj and who doesn't? People from a certain location or people of a certain type of... Uh, background, who goes to Hajj? We discussed that going to Hajj is a once-in-a-lifetime journey, but um, like uh, our brother Faisal here, he has gone more than once, and many times people go more than once. It occurs once a year, um, and it is obligatory upon the adult Muslim who is sane, and they are capable of affording the journey, they are capable in their, their health is, you know, good, in good standing, they, they can actually make the journey, it won't be difficult. And we know that travel nowadays uh, is quite simple, it's much easier than it was many years ago. Um, a few hundred years ago it was a very difficult journey and some people would have to take out many months to plan such a journey all the way to, to Mecca for this pilgrimage. And so, 
um, the word capable encompasses many things because um, it would require men maybe leaving their families for extended periods of time. And so if he could secure that they would be safe and everything they would be taken care of while he was away, then he was capable of going. Um, it also uh, means that he should be free of debt. The woman should be free of debt. They shouldn't be owing anything to anybody um, so that in case something happened to them on the journey, they weren't, you know, there wouldn't be people who would be, you know, demanding something from, from them. So, the, the, you know, the word capable has many, many meanings in it. And uh, um, many people go many times because they feel that it is such a renewal of spirit for them that they, they enjoy that, they look forward to it, they desire it, um, the, the, the pilgrimage itself. Um, so these are the, the basic uh, requirements or the obligations uh, you know, on the person before they make the Hajj. Um, they don't have to go if they are ill, you know, it's it, it, or, or their wealth doesn't afford them to. So they're exempt. They're uh, religiously exempt, and they they're seen as uh, you know people who may have the intention but are unable to uh, to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to add something to this. Yeah, sure. As all all duties in Islam are required by men and women on equal basis once they use they reach their puberty age, mm -hmm. and that's why we call it accountability. Once they are accountable, so and of course they have to be sane. And that's what the really requirements for anybody to do perform any of the rituals of Islam. And Hajj is one of the rituals. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as the exemption, yes, a person may be sick and not able physically to do it, but maybe he is well to do. So he can really get somebody to do on his or her behalf. Sometimes you will find people that they have passed away without doing it. And it's one of the things that a son or a daughter or a relative of that person can do it on their behalf if they, if they did their self the Hajj the first time. Interesting. So that uh, so if someone uh, you know lived their whole lives or unable for one reason or the other, you can actually do a Hajj to f in, in, in the name of that person to have the person fulfill it even posthumous, uh, posthumously yeah. after death. This is uh, this is really interesting. Now, when you say that um, Hajj is a once in a lifetime experience. Uh, is it once in a lifetime for, you know, whenever it's convenient for me? Is it an ongoing thing? Uh, you know, what what is the calendar? What is the schedule? If an Ameri someone in America, for example, you know, a Muslim wants to plan to go on Hajj, what do they need to know concerning the timing uh, of Hajj, uh, Brother Faisal? Well, when we look at the Hajj, is is really a journey for cleansing. You, you, you're getting your soul cleansed and repentance. Mm. You're going there and going through all these troubles and all this hardship so you can really m confirm and affirm your commitment to God and that you repent from all the sins that you have done and you're going to start all over again. Mm. And there has been a misconception among Muslims that, okay, when I get so old, before I die, I'm going to do it so I know I'm not going to do anything wrong <laughs> after that. But you know, thank God people have got the proper uh, understanding that this is a, an obligation once you are capable to do it. Once you are capable to do it financially and physically, then you have to do it. If you delay it, you never know when, you, when it's going to happen. And as a matter of fact, when you go to Hajj, you'll find a lot of people who have really delayed it to the point that they are so handicapped that they have to be carried around or being pushed in a wheelchair. Mm. Or they just go there and they nev never make it. They may die on the, w on, on the way there. So it is, uh, it is while it is required only once in a lifetime. But you can do good things good deeds do not require permission yeah. so you can do it and people feel on their own self and, and their own uh, cleanliness and pureness and, 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 and uh, spirituality some people may need it more that's why maybe I did it twice <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody will feel they need it more now on the issue of uh, you know if I want to go to Hajj and plan it on my calendar right. I believe this year's Hajj comes uh, some, sometime in uh, January in the year 2004 does it always come at the end of the year? You know, when when is Hajj during? Well, the year? there is the Islamic calendar, which is a lunar calendar, and there are twelve months in the lunar calendar. But the months are either a twenty-nine or thirty-day uh, month, mm -hmm. and therefore, um, with the Gregorian calendar, it differs about eleven days every year, and so. Um, 
The Hajj itself comes in its in the twelfth month of the lunar calendar. It's called Dhul Hajjah, and it 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 uh, it the actual rites of it will begin, you know, and occur. The main rites of the, the or the main activity of the Hajj will occur between the eighth and the thirteenth day of Dhul Hajjah. Um, this year, it is correct. It begins it towards the end of in the end of January of two thousand and four. Um, and I believe it will, the, the Eid day or the feast of the sacrifice, w Eid al-Adha, will come on uh, February 1st. I believe this is what has already been determined for 2004. Mm -hmm. And um, because the calendar is off by about 11 days every year, it, it's going to find itself landing in a different season each, each year. It'll come a little earlier every year, and so it, we can see it uh, moving from the winter season to the fall season to the summer season. Not as quickly as that, um, but you know, I think to to completely go through all four seasons, it will take approximately 30 years. So we'll have several years where it is in the winter months, but coming earlier every year, and then several years where it will be in the fall or in the summer. Mm. And such. When, when you say that, I find, uh, I find it very interesting to, you know, to observe the, the opportunity. If, it, if the Hajj uh, season travels through the, uh, you know, uh, within the Gregorian calendar, and if it takes about 30 or 33 years for it to make a full cycle, mm -hmm. and, you know, take it that an average person maybe lives maybe 30 adult years. So at least that gives an opportunity if your schedule is too tight in one season, at least there's another year that Hajj may be a little more convenient for you. I it's find possible. this to be an interesting uh, convenience. Yes, yes. Now, uh, we know that um, Muslims have many famous uh, cities in the, hi in the history of Muslim, Mecca, Medina, Baghdad, Cairo, to uh, Istanbul and so on. Jerusalem. Uh, and, and Jerusalem, uh, uh, very importantly. Where does the Hajj uh, take place? Uh, why does it take place where it does? And can you give us a little background about where Hajj takes place, uh, Brother Faisal? Well, as uh, Sister Karen have mentioned, that the first house has been built to mankind is in Mecca. Mm -hmm. And that house has uh, been built by, according to the most authentic uh, historians is built by angels for Adam when Adam came to earth when he was expelled from heaven and it has been built in that place in Mecca because of the environment and the floods and whatever it has been destroyed and, and been forgotten till the time for Abraham God have peace and blessings on him uh, God have ordered him to rebuild that house and angel Gabriel have showed him where that place is and uncovered the base, the foundation, and they rebuilt that house. And that's, God have ordered him, as it's mentioned in the Quran, to call on all mankind to come to do Hajj, to do pilgrimage. While at that time there was nobody around. And God have told him there will be people coming from every walks of life and from every corner of the world. They would either on camels or whatever, but they will be coming seeking this blessings and seeking this ritual. And from that time on, the ritual has been on for everybody and has been performed by practically all human beings. It has been some deviations, and later on, when Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he came and he reestablished the proper way, which is the way that Abraham, peace be upon him, wanted and God wanted us to do it. So Mecca for us is the most sacred place in earth and it should be for all mankind because this is the first house built by God for human beings on earth and for us Muslims praying one as I mentioned before we have to pray five times a day if we pray any of those times in Mecca it is considered to be almost hundred thousand times worth of reward the sister can mention uh, Jerusalem because Muslims, when they first start praying, they were directing their face toward Jerusalem. And later on, God made us direct ourselves toward Mecca. So you will find every Muslim around the world, when they start praying, they direct themselves toward Mecca, regardless where they are in the world. So you'll find people in the south, Asia, they will be going west, we will be going east. 
So that uh, the direction you face in prayer every day, the Hajj now becomes an opportunity, uh, one, one may, um, uh, one may <coughs> say. The Hajj becomes an opportunity to physically go uh, to that location where you face every, every day and, and, and see that location uh, yourself there in Mecca in present day um, Saudi Arabia. Now, coming to the, the Hajj proper itself, uh, Sister Karen, mm -hmm. uh, someone preparing to go on Hajj, what do they seek to benefit from it? What do, what is the, the, the what's the mode of motivating uh, factor from them? How do they spiritually uh, or even intellectually, you know, prepare themselves? And you know, how do we let's jump into let's jump into the Hajj itself? Well, I'm sure um, the way Muslims prepare for Hajj today is much different than they prepared. Uh, you know, a hundred years ago, or five hundred years ago, or a thousand years ago, um, because uh, depending on how far they were, how far they had to travel, how much time they were going to take into, con you know, have to consider in, you know, making this journey, you know, the provisions that they would have to be able to supply themselves with, um, sort of, uh, you know, makes me uh, realize that that performing Hajj a hundred years ago might have been much more rewarding and performing Hajj uh, during this time when it's quite simple for us to, you know, make airplane reservations and, and travel and, and we have hotel accommodations and, and such. But uh, the, the, the real essence of preparing oneself for the Hajj is the intention or the, 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 <coughs> the spiritual reason why one wants to go to Hajj. And it is a renewal, it is to refresh themselves. And when they, as they get closer and closer to Mecca, there are um, certain areas surrounding Mecca um, that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, called him stations of Ihram, where we, be, where we take on the actual state of mind, the physical state of Ihram, or the, the idea of being uh, a pilgrim the actual pilgrim. And a number of things, and, ch and at this point, uh, that, that take change. There's a change here. Uh, we leave the, the material world behind us. Um, we start to um, dedicate all our thoughts and all our actions specifically to the rites and rituals that occur and take place during the, the Hajj itself. And um, uh, there are some prohibitions that once we reach this point, we, ha we can no longer do. There are some, uh, rec not just recommendations, but requirements that we have to do. For example, the, the man will have to dress in a certain way. He has uh, two stitchless, seamless cloths, white cloths, that he should be dressing himself in. And again, this is to uh, to leave the worldly materials of our, our daily existence behind and to uh, focus on the simplicity, the humility, and uh, the reason for coming to uh, this sacred place. And uh, there are a number of things that, that, that one has to prohibit themselves from doing. Um, at the start of this, though, w many Muslims will say, Labaik Allahumma Labaik, and that is, here I come, O Lord, here I come. And I'm coming only for, for, for God, only for God's, uh, you know, to serve God. I'm doing this as a, as a servant of God. And please, you know, take me in this position as only a servant of God. I, I don't want to serve myself. I'm not going to be thinking of myself. I'm coming only to do this as a, a worshiper, as a servant of God. And uh, so they, they praise God. God has no partners. You know, all of this is a, 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 a re repeated over and over again as they are coming for this ritual of Hajj. The prohibitions that I mentioned, for example, it's even prohibited to uh, perfume yourself. And the perfume, again, um, that we use in our daily life is uh, mostly, you know, a refreshing type of a thing. It's 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 a it's a love for a beautiful smell. Um, uh, 
killing animals or insects or, or causing harm to anybody is also a prohibition once you reach this station and you begin this uh, state of ihram or state of becoming the pilgrim. And it's y you, you don't want to hurt or harm anything because you want to remember that everything belongs to God and you wouldn't want to harm any creature of God. Um, you don't want to break or pull plants up out of the ground. Again, this is so that we um, stop thinking about aggressive behavior. If you imagine yourself grabbing a plant and pulling it out of the ground, you're, you're using some sort of force, you're being some sort, somehow aggressive in nature, and so we want to, to, to remove that aggressive aspect of our, of, of our activity. Um, hunting is not allowed, and this again will develop the mercy for God's creatures and animals. Um, even even uh, activities that we generally go through, you know, in, in our cycle of life, like marrying and, and, and things like that, uh, uh, marital relationships between a husband and wife, all of these things that in normal times of your life are are allowed and recommended and enjoyed are during the ihram state you know, prohibit it. And it's to forget the worldly pressure. We come uh, to forget our normal life. We come only to think about God. Um, being angry or dishonest is another prohibition. And this is so that we can behave like the servant of God. We're not allowed to carry arms or any weapons. And again, that's to reduce the aggressive nature of man. But even things like covering the head for a man or covering the face of a woman or, or um, the men having stitching in their clothing or buttons in their clothing. <coughs> this is to bring us to feel the atmosphere of being the servant of God, mm -hmm. to, to, to find humility in our being human, um, you know, rather than worldly. Um, the the uh, shoes of should not go up above the ankle or should not have stitches in the shoe. So it's a simple shoe. Mm -hmm. And this is also, again, let's express simplicity. Let's get to the basics. What are the real fundamental aspects of the human being? And that is to worship God. Um, cutting the hair, clipping of the nails, again, a worldly activity. And so we should not interfere with nature during this time. So this is the state of ihram or the state of the pilgrim as they come forward to the hajj. And so even the, 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 the symbolic, if you would say, uh, uh, being in this state now is being symbolized by wearing, you know, a simple white cloth and uh, being equal with everyone, whatever your background, and uh, observing sanctity of life and respect and restraint and things like that. Uh, it's, that's, a, that's truly remarkable, I believe, uh, lesson in self-discipline. One of the, perhaps the most uh, visible or popular uh, image uh, that people generally have of Hajj is to see pilgrims in, in their white uh, uh, pieces of cloth that they wrap around themselves going circling around the Kaaba, going around the Kaaba. Uh, what, is, uh, what is that activity all about? Uh, what is it called and, and what does it, what is that activity all about, uh, Brother, Brother Faisal? Well, people going there because this is the house of God. Mm. It's not because it's Mecca or whatever and trying to symbolize that our life is going to circle and going to center around God. And we are here to really reconnect with God and to confirm that we're going all around and around and around and around and around. And throughout the, the journey around Mecca, around Kaaba, mm -hmm. people are only praising God, glorifying God, thanking God, asking for His forgiveness, reconnecting with God. So this is just reassurance to everybody's mind that God is, is, is the center of my life and it's going to be as such. And, and, and when you go through it, while Sister Ken was talking about the process really, it started to bring some tears to my eyes and to remember the, the whole process. As a matter of fact, just, just for, for one to see Kaaba, you, 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 you see yourself just crying. Mm. You see yourself uh, remembering all your sins and hoping and wishing and praying that you never done any of those sins. Mm. And while you're going around Kaaba, you think of God and hoping for His mercy. Interesting. I think that's a very touching, uh, very touching explanation. Many people have uh, very interesting, very deep stories and experiences with Hajj. Uh, and you know, re regarding the, the going around the Kaaba itself, if I may, 
uh, if I may ask uh, you, Sister Karen, uh, what is the significance of, you know, there's a black stone in the Kaaba. Mm. What's the significance of, of that stone? Why do, why do Muslims kiss it? Or is there some reverence for it? What, what does that black stone hold? Well, the, the, there is a black stone that is part of the structure of the Kaaba itself. Mm -hmm. And maybe we should just define the word Kaaba, too, because it's, uh, and I don't know if any of our viewers have seen what the Kaaba looks like, but it is a, a black cubicle structure, and that is the Arabic word for cube, Kaaba, mm -hmm. and this is how it got its name. So part of the structure actually has what is called the black stone in it. And you will see as uh, the pilgrims circle or uh, circumvent uh, the, the Kaaba, you know, go around it. They will try to get close to this black stone. They will try to touch it. Um, yes, this is a, a picture of yeah. the, a or a, a replica of mm -hmm. what the Kaaba looks like. I don't know if we can get that on there. Um, but it is a cube-like structure, and in that structure is the black stone. Mm -hmm. The pilgrims will try to touch it because there's there are many important significances to this black stone. Um, again, very symbolic though. It is not a requirement for the pilgrims to go in and to touch the black stone. But it almost, want, they want to show their love for the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. There was a very significant event in his lifetime where um, this was one of the original foundation uh, stones that the angel Gabriel had brought to uh, Prophet Abraham and his son Ishmael in the construction of the uh, of the Kaaba, and um, so this has a significance. It w it remained with the Kaaba, and of course, as years go on, I, I think you mentioned earlier the you know weather ha plays a role in the the deterioration of structures, and so the Kaaba would have to be refurbished and rebuilt, and it came to a point where you know whoever got to replace this black stone that was an honor given to the person. And um, it, during the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad, it, they were refurbishing the, the Kaaba. And uh, it got to the point where who is going to replace the black stone? And it, uh, people were arguing that everybody wanted the honor. Mm -hmm. And it almost led to tribal feuds. Which tribe would have the honor of replacing the stone? And it came to the decision that the best way to solve it was that the next person who comes through the gates of the, the Kaaba will be the one who will make the decision. and. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, walked through the gates. Mm -hmm. And everybody was very happy and took it as a sign um, from God mm -hmm. that, you know, the Prophet Muhammad, who had become known as the trustworthy and uh, the, the truthful at this time, that he was, he had such a reputation in his community that this is really, he's the best person to replace it or the best person to solve this dispute. Mm -hmm. And he came up with the idea of having all, all of the tribes participate in the returning of the stone, not just one tribe. He kept the brotherhood among the, amongst the clans and the mm -hmm. tribes at that time, which was a very, he, he prevented war, really, in his day. Mm -hmm. And so um, there's, there's a, a great love and respect for the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So many pilgrims want to get close to the stone, touch it as a symbol of their love and respect for him. So it connects them back to back to him, connects them back to what he stood for, uh, what he brought. I mean, one can make all these, uh, reflect upon all of these things in connection with, uh, with the blank stone. Mm -hmm. um, another, um, one of the, I believe, key activities during the Hajj, uh, Brother Faisal, uh, is that the time that pilgrims spend reflecting uh, on, the, on the plain of, uh, of, of Arafah, uh, which which occurs on the ninth day of the twelfth month of the Muslim calendar. Uh, can you tell us a bit about uh, you know what do pilgrims do in this uh, plain of uh, of Arafah? Well, you know Arafah is is a place which is just a few kilometers away from Mecca, mm. and it has a little hill, and it's called uh, Jabal al Rahma, the Mountain of Mercy, mm. and this is. The place there is practically is the main day and main event for a pilgrimage to do the his or her pilgrimage, mm. and that will be on the ninth day. According to uh, the uh, authentic history of Islamic history, they claim that it is the place where Adam and Eve have met on earth after they were expelled from heaven, and this is a place where Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, 
he have performed his Hajj and he have asked us to do it as such to be on that day there and it's also been the same way the people before Muslims used to do it they used to go to to, to Arafah and go from Arafah down back to uh, Mina through the Muzdalifah which is a little place in between and it was the same it's just been re-emphasized and done back to the original way of uh, Abraham peace be upon him and that's where Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him he did his final and maybe the only pilgrimage that he did mm -hmm. and he spoke to all of us and give us advices that we hope and pray that we can hold it hopefully uh, a bit later we can come back to what did he speak about uh, but maybe maybe th th some so people do not really realize because it's, it's the same day for everybody to do it mm. then you'll find more than two million people wow. in this whole location as a matter of fact last time I was done my Hajj was back in 82 and 82 they had a nine lane highway leading to Arafah and that highway is 24 7 <laughs> practically jammed that day because everybody has to go there the same day mm. and not only that the logistics for being there the same day to have water to have accommodations to have this to have that and to be moving around so it's it's it and, and and not only that now you really feel that where Adam came he came with nothing and 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 that's really the the really the peak of Hajj mm. that we are all there at the same time with each other the rich and the poor the powerful and the weak mm. the sick and whatever the black and the white the brown and every color and we are there at the same time wearing the same clothes and and practically living in the same tents most of us mm. will be living in the in, in the same tents and supplicating to the same God. To the same God. So unity and in every way. Yes. Interesting. Interesting. Now, uh, one of the other activities, actually, I believe, before the standing of Arafah, uh, is you know you see pilgrims going between two hills. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what that ritual is? what its origins or what's its yes, symbolism? Yes, the whole Hajj itself has Abrahamic origin mm. and that goes all the way back to the Prophet Abraham and some of the events that <coughs> took place in his and his son's life, Ishmael or Ismail in Arabic. Mm. May peace and blessings be upon them both. Um, we know that Abraham was married to Sarah and that they didn't have any children and because of this, uh, they had desired to have children. Um, Abraham took on took a second wife, who was the the servant of Sarah. Her name was Hag Hagar or H Hajar, and uh, they between the two of them, they had the son Ismail. There was a command to Abraham. Abraham had a, a dream where God commanded him to take Hagar and his son Ismail to the barren land of or, or area of Becca, which is Mecca, mm -hmm. and which is a, a was at the time a desert. There w was not inhabited necessarily by anybody. It, you know, it was a dry locality, and so uh, to leave them there and to return back to his, you know, where he he came from, and. Uh, his wife Hagar asked him is God commanding you to do this and he said yes and she said okay well then I will have patience and I will keep my faith and I will stay mm -hmm. um, but as time went on their provisions that they had brought with them began to run out and it got to the point where they were uh, reaching uh, thirst and hunger and they began to panic a little bit because they were not sure. Now Ismail of course was a child, a baby mm -hmm. at the time and so uh, Hagar's panic was a little bit more. Any mother would know that if she can't feed her child she's gonna you know she's gonna worry more about her child than herself but mm -hmm. both of them were suffering and uh, she began to um, haste herself between the two hills she would run up to one hill to see if she could see anybody or any anything that they could uh, you know ascertain as food or water and she would run to the other hill and look again and she would travel back and forth between these two hills and so th this symbolism that Muslim pilgrims take during the Hajj between those two hills, Safa and Marwa, is to, to remember her struggle at that time. And so the Muslims will hasten themselves between the hills of Safa, 
Safa and Marwa at the same, you know, during the, the pilgrimage. And it goes all the way back to the, the, the time when, when Hagar did this. Um, you know, and by the blessing of Allah, when she returned to her child after not having found any provision, she found him on the ground kicking and from his feet had sprung a spring mm -hmm. and that was the well of Zamzam. So water began coming up at this point and Allah, you know, blessed the two of them because of their patience and her faith mm -hmm. that she was put here for, you know, the purposes of God and to serve God. Um, the well of Zemzem came, it, it, it made the area in this loca location flourish, people started to come and migrate there. Uh, Prophet Abraham, of course, returned to visit his wife and his son, and his son Ishmael Ismail uh, grew to be also a prophet of God. Peace and blessings be upon them. And uh, it was a test. All of this was a test from God, and this struggling family passed that test. And they were blessed, and people came to this area, and it grew into a, a you know, well-populated you know, uh, city or geographical location in the middle of the desert. And it also is another one of the reasons why it became like a major uh, stop along the trade routes, you know, because it was a blessed area. It was a, f you know, a very uh, well-taken-care-of area by God dating back to this this um mm. thing, so it, so it reconnects event. with her with her hope and her trust in god and yes. her uh her courage also and yes. her love and mercy for her, her yes. baby uh now you know winding down uh how does the hajj come to completion you know what marks the end of hajj uh what are the how how do you uh sell you know we talked about beginning hajj preparing how do you end the Hajj, uh, Brother Faisal? Well, as we have been talking about Hajj, that first you go to Mecca, pay your respect, and from there you do some of the rituals. Mm. Some people may come early, some people may come just on time, but on the eve of the ninth, or the eighth, or maybe the fajr of the, the dawn of the ninth, everybody starts moving to Arafah. Mm. And then from Arafah, we come down, to Muzdalifah, and their people are required to spend the night in the open, barren land. And this is where they pick up pebbles from the land there. And usually the pebbles, we have like 49 pebbles, uh, seven, and the pebbles are used later on to come back to Mina. And in Mina, which is a few kilometers away from Mecca, is where the we say the place where the Satan was trying to persuade Hagar, the mother of Ishmael, not to let her husband offer him as a sacrifice. Because he had a dream. Abraham, peace be upon him, had a dream that he's going to sacrifice his son. God asked him to sacrifice his son. So he came and told his son, I had a dream, what do you think? What should I do? He said, Dad, you got a dream from God, then go ahead and do it. And while he was trying to slaughter his son, God had sent him a ram. And that ram where the whole event of pilgrimage and what we call the feast of sacrifice is all about. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, before he tried or to, to, to really execute the order of God, Satan was trying to persuade him and his wife. So there were three places where they used to sit. And this is where we pick up pebbles from that place. So we can symbolize hitting Satan to get out of our life. But it's really more or less just to emphasize that Satan is our enemy, mm -hmm. as it was the enemy of Abraham and Ishmael. Mm -hmm. And ending the Hajj is by going back again to Mecca and having a farewell tribute. And the same tribute is by going around Kaaba seven times, and some of us will go between Safa, the, the two hills, and saying goodbye, mm -hmm. and wishing that they will come back again. Interesting. Uh, I know that uh, people from all over the world join in with the pilgrims during that time to celebrate uh, the, 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 uh, uh, a celebration 
Uh, tell us a bit about that in the few minutes we have left. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a bit about that, what it symbolizes, and w what lessons are there for people in general? Well, the Eid al-Adha, or the Feast of the Sacrifice, is a time for Muslims to reflect on the stories of Abraham and his family and the struggles that they had to go through. They had to um, be very patient. His wife had to be patient uh, being left in the desert. Uh, again, they had to be patient. God commanded Abraham, peace be upon him, to sacrifice his only son. Hagar had to be patient again. God blessed them by replacing it with a lamb. And so it's to remind us uh, of, of the, the being patient human beings mm. and to be uh, reminded Remembering that God can com God commands us, and that we need to obey, and that we should be steadfast and obedient to God. And if we do so, Allah will bless us with many blessings and give us His mercy mm -hmm. and reward us. And so, uh, the the biggest reward of performing the Hajj once in your lifetime is that it is as if all your sins are erased from your record and you are, are coming out fresh and new with a new life in front of you and, and you have a new approach to life. You're renewed. Your spirit is renewed. You, you learn to believe in the mercy, the rahma of God and uh, the blessings of God and you sort of have a whole new outlook at life. At least that is what I would believe you know, I, I, someone who went with the right intention would walk away with. Um, but it's also a time, all Eids, there are two Eids, or two feasts in the Muslim calendar. These are times of a wholesome celebration where people come together, they celebrate, they're thankful for the blessings of God, they gather, they remember God. It is a day of victory, sort of, not a, a victory on a whole, but as an individual. You've succeeded, you're remembering God, you're, you're, you're renewing that spirit. It is a day where we can reap the fruits of our good deeds. Um, we remember those things. We forgive each other. We find humility. And it is a day of peace above all. And so um, there, there are the reenactments of these things instead of sacrificing our sons, which would be, you know, not something that Allah is commanding us. We sacrifice some meat on this day of the, the Eid. And uh, the, the meat will be dispersed to the poor and the needy. We will also give it, some of it to our friends and relatives. And then we may enjoy some of it also. And so there's a lot of meat, a lot of um, uh, meat that is being prepared during this time. And now, because we have maybe two million who attend the Hajj and people in their homelands are also uh, doing a sacrifice on this day as well, you know, just to, to go along with those pilgrims who are performing the Hajj. Uh, there's a lot of meat that that is being dispersed. It is taking care of the needs is of the needy and the all poor. All in Saudi Arabia? Or no, it, it, uh, what I understand is that nowadays, because there are so many and that there's so much, mm -hmm. that it is packed and shipped all around the world oh, and it is given to uh, organizations that see to feeding the needy around the world. Very good. Yes. Now, uh, I believe we have about a minute or so left. Sister Karen uh, talked about the individual renewal that one, you know, the spiritual rebirth that one gets in Hajj. Uh, Brother Faisal, how would you, what would you say that the world stands to learn from this act in Islam? This, you know, what, what universal lesson is there for the Hajj? I know that uh, one of the famous pilgrimages uh, or, or Hajj of any individual, at least in this part of the country, was that of Malcolm X. What lesson do you think the world stands to learn from that, from the last sermon of the Prophet you mentioned earlier? What can you briefly say concerning that? Well, pilgrimage really is not unique to Muslims. Mm. It really has been from Abraham time, peace be upon him. And people have to really realize that we are all not only believe in Abraham, but we believe in God, the one who created us. And that symbolizes also Adam's place which all of us are from Adam. And in the final sermon that Prophet Muhammad has said, he says, I would like for you to know that you are all from Adam. All human beings were created from Adam. And then Adam was made of dust. Mm. Not only that we are all brothers and sisters, but we have to humiliate ourselves because we came from dust. Mm. Regardless how rich we are, how strong we are, how powerful we are, we have to remember where we came from. And this is a message that throughout the Quran, reminding us human beings, 
about the origin of our father and our origin. We didn't come from the hospital because we were in the hospital and, 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 uh, uh, but we came out of a sperm mm. and God remind us of that. And if the whole world will just remember that we are all from Adam and Eve, we are all brothers and sisters, and God is what our colors, because this is the miracle of God that he created us with different colors and different sizes and different tongues. Mm. And also, we ourselves, regardless how high we go in society, we still are from earth where our forefather is. The other thing is, we can get along with each other if we think about ourselves as brothers and sisters, mm. as well as, regardless how rich I am. Yesterday, I wasn't rich. <laughs> Adam wasn't rich. And this is something, if the world will, will look at it, and that's what Malcolm X, Malcolm X, when he, before he went to Hajj, he really had a grudge against white people. But when he went there, he found out that Muslims, white, black, brown, any color. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, he was saying that even they drink from the same cup and they eat and sit on the floor and eat with each other and the color doesn't exist. Where he came from doesn't know, it's not known to anybody. And from there on, he came back with a new vision and a new version and a new feeling and a new spirit about Islam. Interesting. I, I must, one must say that uh, many, I, I believe that's what, uh, impresses many people uh, the most uh, about Hajj. Uh, you've mentioned that you've made Hajj. Have you made Hajj, Sister Karen? Do you hope I, to? I hope to make Hajj. Inshallah, Hajj. God willing, I will be able to make it. And um, I, I believe, you know, when I, when I really think about Islam and I, I look at a gathering in, the, in a mosque mm. of uh, people from all different backgrounds, I, I envision Hajj and what it's going to be like because this will be like a, a, a convention of mankind, mm. some sort of conference of mankind, an annual conference of peace where people come together from all different walks of life. Um, and the Hajj is breaking the barriers of language, race, ethnicity, territory, and the bond of faith brings mankind together in, in this sense. And I think that common affairs are shared, we understand each other, we get a taste of what it's like. And I, it's almost the lit litmus test of tolerance, mm -hmm. Hajj, because one will be faced with people who dress differently, speak differently, look differently, uh, cook their foods differently, um, have different mannerisms, and you, you really have to um, look at the dignity of man over all of those differences that we have. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you find the respect for each other, and you find the tolerance of each other, and you learn the compassion of loving one another, of coming close to each other. It's almost something that I feel like if I make Hajj, I, I think I would just like to have the rest of my life in that situation. <laughs> well, Allahu Alam, God knows, but it, it seems like the, the utopian world. It's like mm -hmm. everybody together in one place, in one locality. Everybody um, is, you know, leaving their homes behind, their families behind. Everybody is coming only for the sake of God. Um, it's a spiritual environment. What more could we ask for? You, you see so much, you learn so much, you develop your spirituality. Um, you're commemorating the great prophets, uh, Abraham and Ismail and Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon them. And it is also, and Hagar, it is also a reminder of the Day of Judgment. If you mm. think about it, one day we will all come together again. Mm. We will all be brought together and we will be judged by God. So it is a reminder, mm. again, puts us in our place. And we see huma humanitarian interests as well. Uh, we understand each other, we learn about each other, we begin to feel for each other. Mm. And I think it's the ultimate teaching of tolerance. Interesting. Interesting. But you were there too. You visited Becca, right? No, I've never been. Oh, you didn't go with Bayou? Uh, no, my son was, and my husband's had the pleasure of making oh, okay. Hajj. Okay. And my son has gone for Umrah, mm. and um, uh, hopefully he will be able to take me <laughs> for the Hajj. Inshallah. It was his preparation for taking me, Inshallah. God willing. That's, that's, Inshallah. that's excellent. Well, uh, we see that uh, Hajj, um, in it, it means so many different things. It's a journey to go and discover yourself. You leave yourself, your itinerary, your schedule, your being very busy. So you leave yourself to make a long journey, long trip to go discover yourself. 
Yes. And you come back with this new you, this new and refreshed you, uh, having gone to an environment where you've been reminded about God, about the hereafter. Many have likened we're in ihram to, you know, the the, the, the shroud, the shroud of, of the death. Grave, yes. Uh, many have likened Arafah that uh, Brother Faisal spoke about. Uh, have, have likened it to standing before God on the day of judgment. So you go and get this whole cycle of uh, reminders and reflections about life and its value mm -hmm. and then you go back home and hopefully you disseminate and illuminate your family, your area and the whole world hopefully with these new lessons and this spirit. Bridging the gaps. Exactly, of Hajj. Uh, I think it's really remarkable. I hope to make Hajj too. Inshallah, God willing. Inshallah. And I want to uh, thank our viewers for tuning in and uh, hopefully you enjoyed this program. And I want to especially, especially thank my two guests for such a wonderful program and the presentation, Sister Karen Danielson. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Brother Faisal Hamouda, very, very grateful for your very inspiring uh, reflections and pieces of uh, information concerning the Hajj. Thank you very much for inviting me. This is your program in Hajj. I am your host, Bashir Mundi, saying, Assalamu alaikum. Peace be with you. Wa alaikum salam.